Um, now it is my pleasure to welcome you to the session called Introduction to Primary Immunodeficiency Diseases. This afternoon's session is presented by Dr. Kenneth Paris and Dr. Ricardo Sorensen. Dr. Paris is an Associate Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Allergy, Allergy, and Allergy Immunology at Louisiana State University Health Services School of Medicine. He is also the Division Head of the Allergy Immunodeficiency De Immunology Department and Director of the Allergy Immunology Fellowship Program. Dr. Paris is an attending physician at Children's Hospital of New Orleans. And I would like to introduce you to Dr. Sorensen. Dr. Ricardo Sorensen is a professor of pediatrics and head of the Department of Pediatrics at Louisiana State University Health Services School of Medicine. He is also the director of the Allergy Immunology Department at Children's Hospital of New Orleans and is an attending physician at this facility. So please join me in welcoming Drs. Paris and Dr. Sorensen. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Um, and I just want to welcome all of you to our city. We're very happy that um, everyone was able to travel down probably from places very far away to join us um, for the weekend and have a lot of fun and also um, some good learning about uh, primary immunodeficiency and how it affects individuals and also for families as well. I'm going to talk today about our immune system. And the name of this presentation in general is called uh, children with infections more than meets the eye. And I think that sort of speaks for itself. Many of these diseases uh, don't really present um, very clearly um, to physicians' offices, and they're very, very complex. Many physicians really don't know much about them, and we'll learn a little bit about why that is um, in the next 45 minutes. So I do have some disclosures. Um, I speak a little bit on behalf of Baxalta, CSL, and UpToDate. Um, and Dr. Sorensen as well um, also works a little bit for Baxter and also for UpToDate, mostly for educational and research purposes. So let's start by thinking a little bit about immunity. So what really is immunity? It's a word that we throw around a lot in clinic. Um, and you have questions about your immune system. Our immune system is really part of our body that keeps us healthy most of the time. You see this little boy, he's playing you know, in a lot of mud, um, and most parents and grandparents would be all worried that for sure this child is going to get some sort of horrible infection from getting in contact with all sorts of you know, dirt and germs. But in reality, most children who play and go outside and get filthy dirty all day in the summertime come home, we wash it off, and nothing really happens. They never get ill from that contact. And that's because we have an immune system. Um, and that immune system has one really important function. It uses a combination of cells, of proteins, and then of body organs working together to protect us from that infection. How does that work? Well, it recognizes a danger signal. And I think that's a very important concept to think about when we talk about our immune system and specifically about immunodeficiencies. Um, here again, what you'll see is a, a particle of food. Um, let's see. In the center of the screen, there are bacteria on that. Um, we all eat food, we all eat bacteria almost every day, and we really never get sick, and that's because our immune system functions to help protect us from that danger signal, from that bacteria. I mentioned earlier that many physicians don't recognize primary immunodeficiencies, and part of that is because in the American medical school education, Immunity and our immune system, and specifically primary immunodeficiencies, are not really stressed. Um, many times medical students see a slide like this, and it's quite complex. And when this slide flashes up on the screen in a medical student class, half the audience falls asleep because it's really not engaging. Um, this is another way that uh, the immune system is presented to medical students, and in this really complex way, after the first half of the audience has fallen asleep, the second half falls asleep, and they never learn about what the immune system really is. 
So instead of presenting our immune system in this way, what I wanted to do was make it a little bit more approachable for everyone so that you can get a better understanding of what the immune system is on a basic level, right? And so that you'll know more than your general pediatrician or more than your internist um, in regards to uh, immunity and primary immunodeficiency. So I found these slides at one point and I think they're really great at getting the point across about what each component of our immune system does for us to protect us from a danger signal and how they work together to keep us healthy and keep us free of disease. So the first thing to think about is what is the enemy invader, right? I mentioned earlier that we have to recognize a danger signal. And so the enemy invader is usually a bacteria or a virus. Occasionally it can be something called a fungus or a mold. Um, but the general danger signal that we have to recognize is a bacteria or virus. And they come in many different forms and they can attack many different parts of our body. Um, good examples might be a bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus or Staph aureus. That's a bacteria that typically impacts mostly our skin and soft tissues. It doesn't usually infect other parts of our body. Another common bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae, that doesn't infect our skin for the most part. It only affects our sinopulmonary tract or our upper respiratory or lower respiratory system. So there's very uh, significant specificities as to what these danger signals are and where they attack our body. We have cells in our body called macrophages, or a macrophage, um, and these are really the body's radar. They travel through our bloodstream, they live in our tissues, and they recognize or detect the enemy. They typically don't do much to kill the enemy, or the danger signal, they just recognize it, attach to it, and do some complex interactions that might help the rest of our immune system, okay? Next, we have a cell called the neutrophil. All these names that I'm mentioning, you may have had your pediatrician or your internist mention over the course of your disease or over the course of your uh, medical care. And what I'm trying to do is get you to understand what each one means. So a neutrophil can be thought of as a first responder. It also travels often through your bloodstream and it can recognize bacteria and kill those bacteria by producing toxic substances. This would be the cell that's very important in abscess formation. So in patients with certain diseases, and I'll mention one by name called chronic granulomatous disease, the defect or the absence of neutrophils would lead somebody to have certain types of infections that um, would normally cause abscesses but do not. So neutrophils are very important in uh, abscess formation and for the prevention of infections by that bacteria I mentioned, Staph aureus. Here's another type of cell that I'm sure many people have, uh, have heard of, and maybe you mentioned that this morning at the rally for SCID, and that would be the killer or the cytotoxic or just plain T cell. So the T cell is really the assassin of the immune system. It can function to kill bacteria and kill viruses directly, and it's very important for those life-threatening infections that really can be the downfall of babies with severe combined immune deficiency. If we don't have T cells, we don't have the ability to fight off those really life-threatening infections. There's another form of T cell called the T helper cell, or the T helper. Um, this we can think of sort of as a communication link. It travels through our bloodstream, it interacts with some cells, and it talks between the macrophage and the B cell, which we'll mention in just a minute. And it does that by producing some chemicals we call chemokines. These are signaling proteins um, that tell the other cells what to do in the formation of an immune response in recognition and of clearance of that danger signal. Here we see one of the most important cells in our immune system, and that's going to be the B cell, okay? B cell make antibodies. I consider this the war factory. It's sort of like the um, 
Northrop Grumman of the um, immune system. It's, uh, it makes all of the things you need um, called antibodies to both prevent and uh, clear out infections. These antibodies are very important in multiple ways, and we'll talk about that in just a few slides. So antibodies, we also call antigen busters. Antigens are another word for the uh, proteins or the bacteria, the things our immune system rep uh, recognizes. Each antibody is very specific. It's designed to seek out and destroy a specific enemy antigen. So each antibody recognizes only one bacteria or only one virus, and our immune system is able to make millions and millions of types of antibodies when it functions normally. These antibodies can do a multitude of things. They can prevent viral infections from even occurring as long as we get immunized and we make protective antibodies. They can neutralize toxins if you do come, up, come down with an infection. Um, a good example might be tetanus um, infection. And then another uh, function of these antibodies would be to stick to bacteria and allow for the remainder of the immune system to clear out a specific infection. Here you see on the right-hand side a few letters, IgG, IgA, and IgM. And I'm sure that many people in the audience have recognized these. These are the types of antibodies that our immune system works that fight infection and that can create havoc when not produced in normal quantities. Complement. So complement is a part of our immune system which is rarely abnormal, but when it is, it can lead to life-threatening and, and very disastrous um, infections. I think of these sort of as the support troops. The support troops that sort of go out into the field, help out with all the rest of the immune cells, and, and talk and sort of clear out um, the, the complicated business that's been happening between the B cells and the danger signals. This protein recognizes bacteria that's coated with antibodies and sort of eats away at it and clears it from our system so that we're able to move on to the next uh, danger signal um, that might come across our way. When that complement and those bacteria and those antibodies are stuck on uh, the danger signal on the bacteria, we call that an immune complex, and that's what needs to be cleared so that we can um, move on to the next uh, danger signal. And if you think about it, all this sort of process of activating our immune system creates what I mentioned earlier, cytokines, um, chemicals that lead to the feelings that we have when we have an infection. So you get fever, you get uh, body aches, you get chills, um, and that's because your immune system, when it's functioning normally, gets revved up and produces lots of those chemicals. And we need to have a mechanism by which to tell our body, slow down. The infection is clear, it's time to stop making those chemicals, it's time to stop that immune response. And we have a cell in our body called a T suppressor cell. These cells are really a breaking system. They signal to the B cell and they signal to the other immune complex or the other immune cells in our body to stop making all of those chemicals and, and tone it down a little bit so that we can go on with normal life. Here's a few other characters that we um, have in our immune system. We have our skin, for example. That's a barrier to, pro to um, danger signals. It's a physical uh, barrier so that our immune system or our uh, bloodstream is protected from exposure to those uh, bacteria and viruses. Our mucous membranes, so our mouth, our nasal passages, are all places that function to sort of keep the danger signal um, on the outside, away from the interior parts of our body. And then all these immune cells sort of function within organs in our body. And I'm going to go over just a few of them. 
um, because these are all components of our immune system that you've recognized um, or probably heard of over the years. So tonsils and adenoids, lymph nodes and thymus, these are all places where T cells and B cells are located in our body and work to function um, to make antibodies and to fight off infections. And when we get an infection, we've all noticed that these areas become swollen. They become tender. They become hot and warm to the touch. And what that tells us is that our immune system is functioning to sort of clear out the infection and do what it's supposed to do. Um, when we miss or when we lack some of these organs, for example, tonsils or adenoids or thymus um, in diseases like skid, it's really a hallmark that there's something wrong with our immune system and it's not able to function normally. Um, even our appendix, which you can see down here, is really a lymphatic tissue. It's a lymphoid organ. It's packed with immune cells. And that's why when you get appendicitis, it's so painful, it's so hot, and they have to remove it because it's a, a nidus or a, a localized inflammation um, in that component of our immune system. Here you see the bone marrow. You know, we think about bone marrow in regards to the production of red blood cells that keep us alive and bring oxygen to our tissues. But if we think about the different types of immune cells, the B cell is actually developed inside our bone marrow, okay? So our bone marrow is very important um, in the development of our, our immune system. And for kids who have undergone stem cell transplant, that's where the regeneration of their immune systems occurs after transplant in order to restore immunity and hopefully bring a cure um, to those, those children. The thymus is important because that's where T cells develop. It's no wonder they're called T cells. They're called T cells because they develop in that thymus um, in prenatal life before kids are born. And so this is sort of like what a normal immune response would be um, within our body. First, a danger signal comes in, it drops a bomb, and all of these uh, components or cells within our immune system need to work together and in concert in order to develop a normal immune response and fight off that infection. So unfortunately, as you all know, because you're here at the Immune Deficiency Foundation Conference, um, that system doesn't always work perfectly, right? So what I had talked about is what works in an ideal patient. Um, and not only, um, or not always does that work. So we have a term and it's called immune deficiency. And immune deficiency is the term that describes what happens when the immune system is unable to protect us against the pathogens in our environment. Worldwide, we think about immune deficiency um, the most common form is actually HIV infection, human immunodeficiency virus, and many pediatricians and internists are more familiar with that disease than primary immunodeficiencies, which are things that we're going to talk about today. So what exactly is PI? You all know you're at the Immune Deficiency Foundation. Um, it is unfortunately a group of diseases that impacts, you know, many, many people in this nation and probably millions of people worldwide. Over the years, we've div discovered um, 250 individual diagnoses that we now classify as primary immunodeficiency. And just a few years ago, this exact talk said 150. Um, a f about two years ago, it was 200, and now I can say about 250. Um, and that's amazing when you think about the research that's has gone on over the last several years. So obviously we can't talk about all of them, but I wanna focus on some background or just a few to help us understand um, our diagnosis um, that we have. A key point is that patients with primary immunodeficiency have an increased vulnerability to infections. Um, and that vulnerability is really specific to the type of deficiency um, that you're affected by. Every immunologist has a similar slide um, to this one. And what it really means, what it is designed to do is just give us an idea of how, as to how common um, these immune deficiencies are, each specific one. 
So by far, the majority of immune deficiencies have antibody deficiency in them or have a portion of the defect affecting antibodies. So that would be something like 70 to 80 percent. And if I asked for a, a raise of hands and I said, how many people in the audience have an antibody deficiency or have low IgG, probably 80 percent of the hands would um, be raised in the audience, okay? So this is where the majority of our primary immunodeficiency diseases um, lie. Some diseases affect only the cellular or the T cell compartment. There's a group of diseases that affect the phagocytes or the neutrophils. Um, I mentioned those are the ones that are important in abscess formation. And then a very small component um, are complement deficiencies. And I know that there are people at this conference with every one of these diseases or a combination thereof. I mentioned that the most common one is the antibody system or the antibody deficiencies, and so I'm going to touch briefly upon that. So I mentioned that antibodies bind to foreign danger, and what's interesting is that our antibodies typically get better with age, all right? So even in patients who might have mild immune deficiencies in the first few years of life, there's a chance that that could improve and that that immune deficiency might actually be outgrown. And there's a classic disease called transient hypogam of infancy, which is exactly that. It's a child who has an immune deficiency in the first few years of life, but they outgrow it as time goes on. Antibodies are important because we can induce them by vaccination. Part of your evaluation probably involved the vaccine probably Pneumovax for many of you, and we measured how well that uh, vaccine worked. Um, that's very important for both the diagnosis and the management of um, various immune deficiencies. So this is a sort of complicated slide, but what I just wanted to show is that each part of our immune system is important in the clearance of specific bacteria or for certain diseases, and I sort of mentioned that earlier. So antibodies produced by B cells in concert with complement are important for protection from ear infections or otitis media. They're important for infections like sinusitis or bronchitis, okay? But they're really not very important for infections with staph bacteria. T cells, on the other hand, are very important for infections caused by fungi. They're very important for infections caused by viruses like herpes, okay? And so patients who have T cell deficiencies are susceptible to these life-threatening infections. And then neutrophils, as I mentioned earlier, are very important in the clearance of bacteria that cause abscesses. Here we see just what a T cell might look like in the bloodstream. And while this isn't important really for you, um, for physicians, this is what we learn. And unfortunately, learning what a T cell looks like on a slide doesn't help us diagnose a patient um, that comes to our clinic um, sick and with classic uh, signs of an immune deficiency. Here we see what a neutrophil looks like. Um, and we learn in medical school that these neutrophils fight off specific infections, but we don't really learn about uh, primary immunodeficiencies. Um, and in the next part of the talk, what I hope we'll, Dr. Sorensen and I will teach you um, are some of the illnesses and diseases or infections um, that bring these diseases to light in the physician's office. So I'm going to have Dr. Sorensen come up, and he will continue with what makes physicians suspect um, primary immunodeficiency diseases and how we go about diagnosing that. Ricardo? Yeah, you can use I was just using, I was just clicking with the mouse. Just yeah. you can do that or just click on the side. Okay, um, you know, looking at this uh, big audience brings back memories from 10 years ago and before, where every year we had a pediatric board review course in this hotel. 
but it was entirely different. I was totally lost this morning because the entrance was on the other side. Here was a shopping mall, and then Katrina came, and this hotel was closed for many years. So it's uh, very nice to see it back in beautiful shape. <laughs> so now I will try to tell you when do we suspect that there is an immune deficiency, and I'll spend most of the time on the suspecting of an immune deficiency. And this is very important because, you know, when we call them primary immune deficiencies because they are determined by some errors in our genetic code. And every, patients that have this are born with that error, but they may not be sick. That error in the code alone doesn't make a patient sick. So <clears throat> very importantly, uh, we have to teach our colleagues in particular that patients with immune deficiencies may go through long periods of time when they are doing very well, and they are normal, okay? But they have a susceptibility factor, and then they can get an infection or they can, they can develop autoimmunity, inflammation, or other complications. And so, it is important over the last few years, we have understood that while infections are always the main presentation for immune deficiencies, patients with immune deficiencies have many other issues. They may have uncontrolled inflammation, autoaggression, that is autoimmunity, malignancy, and even some forms of allergy. So now we put infections at the center of what affects patients with immune deficiency, but you see a whole host of other abnormalities that may also occur, and this is very important. So the main characteristics of the infections that call our attention to are that, that they are either very severe, that they are recurrent, or they are caused by unusual pathogens that normally do not infect people. So then the first thing is when we get a patient, and in each clinic we get these patients frequently referred for allergy, but then we find out that they also have infections and that they need antibiotics all the time, we have to define the clinical phenotype here. So you are probably aware of the 10 warning signs that the Jeffrey Model Foundation <coughs> developed many years ago. These have been uh, well-known worldwide, actually. They have been translated into many languages, and they are based on saying if you have four or more new ear infections within one year, you should suspect there are two or more serious sinus infections, two or more uh, months on antibiotics, etc. I won't spend time telling you there is a slightly modified version for adults, because another development that Ken already mentioned is that we see more and more immune deficiencies that although they are part, they are caused by an abnormality in your genes, they may find their clinical expression only in adolescence or even in adulthood. So what is the problem with these warning signs? I think that I have observed it, I've been lucky to travel to many countries, how big an impact this warning signs had, but then now we are also aware of the problems. In many patients with a positive warning signs, there is no immune deficiency. And when we evaluate too many patients and they're all normal, then people get discouraged from looking for them. What I find more important is that patients that have an immune deficiency would not have been recognized if we would have waited for the warning signs to appear. And that's why the rest of my talk will be, we have to become more, we have to become more alert and try to interpret abnormalities before all these recurrent infections happen. Uh, there have been a, another attempt that uh, we published uh, recently with a group of my friends throughout Latin America, and that is directed to the different subspecialists, telling them by, for each symptom that a dermatologist, an infectious disease, a pulmonologist, especially, can see, think about an immune deficiency. 
and that uh, defines things a little bit more. If you see here, the warning signs say one or two pneumonias per year, etc. We say, wait a moment, it depends on what pneumonias we are talking about. There are walk-in pneumonias where patients can be treated for a few days with antibiotics and they are fine. They are probably not reflecting an immune deficiency. But uh, there is a long list here if a pneumonia requires hospitalization, especially if they end up in the intensive care unit, if they require intravenous antibiotics, if they, re if they are bilateral, if they cause severe tissue damage, then even one pneumonia is an indication that something is wrong with the, with the way that a patient can fight an infection. So this is a, another level uh, of, uh, and this is what I now teach, because, you know, every subspecialty in medicine, endocrinologist, cardiologist, we all have warning signs for everything. And out there, the <laughs> general practitioners, general pediatricians, they go, what are we going to, how are we going to remember all these things? So I think it's more important to have just a few concepts very clear in your mind, and I'll try to get to those through a patient that is an adaptation of a little boy that we know, but it's not exactly the whole history. But to begin with, this was a beautiful, beautiful looking boy, 14 months old, referred to uh, an allergist for uh, evaluation of allergy. Well developed, first child, unremarkable family history. But for allergies, there was one issue that didn't quite fit, recurrent upper respiratory infections, URI, and otitis media, starting very early in life, starting at three months, and requiring more than 12 antibiotic treatments in the last 12 months. We always ask how many times have you needed antibiotics in the last year? Because many patients are referred to us for other things and oh well, he also needs antibiotics. But that, you know, to us that is very significant. To many people since antibiotic use has become so common, it's no big deal. And there was one uh, febrile episode. So this otitis media deserves more attention. And the issue is, was this a normal history? A child, first child, so no older siblings to con bring infections home with so many ear infections. Uh, we have to decide on that. And there are a number of things we have to decide if the child is fully immunized, uh, if there are other uh, predisposing factors and uh, what are predisposing factors for otitis media? Anatomic abnormalities, if anything in the way the ear functions is not appropriate. So that is also the eustachian tube dysfunction, excessive pacifier use, bottle feeding, smoke exposure, and then very commonly chronic rhinitis or allergic rhinitis. Allergy produces an inflammation that makes it easier for bugs to grow. So sometimes by treating the allergy a bit. But there is also the immune deficiency. So these last two diagnoses are the ones that we concentrate. And when do we suspect that just otitis, which is sort of a, if you want, a relatively minor infection, very common in children, but when should just otitis uh, make a suspicion that there may be more? Early onset three to five months of age already otitis. Each recurrence after antibiotic use, complications and otitis that goes into the surrounding bones, association with invasive infections, frequently recurrence after ear infections. Patients have had two, three, four, I have six sets of ear tubes and keep getting sick. Well, uh, something else is wrong, right? So it could be any one of the six, but it's amazing how people don't pay attention to this. And well, actually, some patients get ear, ear tubes and the in, ear infections stop, but they begin to have sinusitis, to just move the site of the infection to another site of the upper airway. So that's another issue. So our patient had early onset, had recurrence after antibiotic, 
uh, treatment and had an invasive infection. Physical examination, this happens all the time. Even my, our fellows, we have to keep teaching them. Just if they have shiners or if they have a trippy nose, that doesn't mean that it is allergy. You have to show that there is an allergy because it could be infections too that may mean an immune deficiency. Purulent nasal secretion is unusual, and then in this particular case, as Ken said, uh, our sites where immunity takes care, lymph nodes, etc., they were not very developed in this child. Uh, this kid actually had uh, the most severe form of antibody deficiency, X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, and one of our speakers, I think she's coming in, in two or three days, uh, Dr. Marilyn Conley, who is a specialist in this particular form of disease, will tell you that I think 20% of all patients with the most severe form of antibody deficiency have only ear infections. So obviously, most patients that have recurrent ear infections do not have this form of disease, but you have to take into account uh, other characteristics of the ear infections to this. So, here are again, and this is what I want medical students and our colleagues to remember rather than warning signs, that the types of infection that should call our attention to the possibility of uh, immune deficiency is the severity, and only one infection may be enough for that. Unusual, somebody gets infections severe infections with candida. We all have candida. Everybody in this room, I assure you, if we look for them, you have candida somewhere in your body, in your gut probably. But you don't even know it, it doesn't cause infection. But if you have it in other areas of your body, then this mild fungus uh, becomes a pathogen and something is wrong. There is a reason, not necessarily a primary immune deficiency. Chronic, anybody that gets a virus but can't get rid of the virus forever, and then uh, that is a problem if they are recurrent. And then also inflammation. You know, patients that have infections but do not develop fever ever, that's abnormal. Or if you have too much fever and it never stops, that's abnormal too. So you have to try to see what is the normal phenotype or the normal clinical characteristic of each infection. Oops, I got lost here, sorry. I think this is going backwards now. Yeah, I was wrong. So, this is my message to our colleagues in infectious diseases, because they are sometimes our most difficult partners in this business, some of them. I tell them, every recurrent, unusual, or severe infection has to occur in a susceptible patient because the majority of patients do not have those. So, if you identify the cause of the infection, the bacteria, and to which antibiotic that bacteria is susceptible, or the virus, or the fungus, that is very important for treatment. But you should also think, why does this individual have this infection? So, identification of a pathogen of any nature and its susceptibility to antibiotics, antiviral, antifungals is important, but consideration of why a given pathogen causes disease is, is, in a specific patient is also important. If you remember that, you will diagnose immune deficiencies very easily. That's all you need to know. If an infection is just not what you expect a given pathogen to cause, and then you should think why. And actually, diagnosis of immune deficiency, I could summarize, say, why? Why? If you say, why does this patient get the infections, you will uh, find a reason to try to identify what the problem is. And I will say a few words about family history because this is also important. Uh, we usually say the family history is negative. 
the patient is the only one getting sick. Um, but what do you think if a mother tells you, I have four children, and number two is the one that gets sick? All the others are healthy. So negative family history, right? Nobody else has an immune deficiency. Is it negative to you? No, it's positive, right? That child has a problem that is not due to the environment in which these children are growing up. It's, mothers have told me that they have been accused of not taking good care of the child, and why don't you pay more attention? But well, how are the other three doing well and that child gets sick? So even if there's nobody else sick in the family, uh, in the fam in the family history could be considered negative, it is actually a positive indication that we need to look for why that child or that individual in a family is getting sick, and that is an immune deficiency. Uh, obviously, if you have family members that are uh, affected with an immune deficiency, that is another big indication. That is a truly positive family history. So then the type of genetic defect, Ken already mentioned that the immune deficiencies, every week there is another description of another immune deficiency and the, they are ex, an extremely varied group of diseases. So are their inheritance forms. And you know, even if you're, not, there are different forms of inheritance where the mother is important, where the father may be important. Some uh, just affect only boys, actually very frequently boys or males. And others really have a different form of genetics. So the point is that there are many different forms of inheritance of primary immune deficiencies and that is something that we need to be aware of. But what we also need to understand is that epigenetics, which are factors that condition how our genes are actually expressed and how, uh, well, how they are expressed is more important today to me than genetics. Genetics is the easy part. You can do sequencing, you find out that something is wrong in the DNA, but why in the same family that has exactly the same genetic defect, the diseases that are caused by this may go from no disease at all to very, very different diseases, like hypogamma globulinemia to uh, severe uh, Epstein-Barr, that's uh, mononucleosis, viral infection to aplastic anemia, etc. in exactly the same family with exactly the same mutation. So how is it that the same gene uh, in different people leads to different diseases? So this is another important issue to consider when you take a family history, because Family members may not have exactly the same form of clinical expression that, uh, your, that the patient we are seeing may have. So this is a little example you start. Uh, it starts actually, let's say, in this case, with a gene defect in the X, link, in the X chromosome in a male, and that leads to a molecular defect that prevents the cell from functioning normal, and this then leads to multiple abnormalities. They can produce antibodies, they have low B cells, or uh, anyhow, the clinical, ex the immunological expression is quite variable. But the point I want to make is that the same gene may have a classic phenotype, that's the one we expect, but it may have variants that look very different, the same mutation. And this classic phenotype and the variants may be caused by entirely different mutations. For instance, this morning we discussed newborn screening to detect SCID, severe combined immune deficiency. There are over, I think by now, 26 genes whose mutations all give you SCID. Okay, so, and there are X-linked diseases like this, and there are non-X-linked or autosomal dominant in autosomal recessive diseases. So again, al why an alertness? <laughs> you know, those are the two things that we have to teach people.
to try to always seek uh, an, an explain, possible explanation for why the disease is there, but also you need to know a little bit about this. This is important, and I think sometimes we don't emphasize the right kind of teaching about this. So uh, we are very short of time. The diagnosing of immune deficiency can already introduce, and I'm not going to stop on that. You will hear many other talks, you know, but I think that uh, this is just uh, now, again, an outdated list. There are at least eight forms of immune deficiencies. There are plenty of abnormalities, and I stopped counting in 2009. Uh, every two years this is updated, and I got, I mean, I can't keep up with uh, the numbers here because they just are growing uh, too fast. And there are over 200 genes that may be affected. The point that is very important to me, that even if we can say these patients all have X-linked A-gamma globulinemia, or for adults, common variable immune deficiency, each patient is different. And a good physician, a good immunologist, and a good caretaker of a patient need to understand the tremendous variability uh, that, is, is, that is so important in primary immune deficiencies so that we adapt our diagnostic and our treatment to each uh, patient. So this is what Ken showed you. Uh, there are fascinating relationships between very specific defects and only one type of infections and others where the patients are open to any kind of infection. So there's a big variation, and we can learn a lot of immunology and infectious diseases by paying attention of these, sorry, but experiments of nature that are the primary immune deficiencies. And uh, this is a slide from Ken. How can we help? I think immunologists are becoming a very sort of <clears throat> after subspecialty because people are understanding that we are more than allergists. We really are uh, specialized in understanding the why of many diseases that can be related to immune deficiencies. And um, we work together here at uh, Children's Hospital, and Children's Hospital has a research institute, and we are not alone. We are fortunate to have uh, other colleagues working with us, and we have a strong group. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.